we're going to close this first little portion of our set with a song that most people, I believe, uh, associate with Dean Martin. Well, uh, do you associate? Uh, <laughs> uh oh, never mind, this is the wrong song. <laughs> Man, you don't associate this with Dean Martin. This song, uh, you associate with Tatum and Ryan O'Neill in a movie together. What is it? Paper Moon. Yeah, so you go with it. You're all the world to me, my love. You make everything so fine. Oh, you make my dreams reality. And with you, life is divine, so divine. Say it's only a paper moon. Say sailing over a cardboard sea. But it would be make-believe if you
sunshine's melody as the clouds go drifting by. Theater people is doing a musical. 
we'll call the music man. I think you should go sing for him. Well, she went in and wowed them and got the lead. And generally, not the theater deal hires more older adults to do the roles. <clears throat> she did it. She did it very, very well. And this is when I came in contact with the trade rooms from Fowler. These gentlemen, uh, if you know the music man, has a, uh, a quartet. It's very charming. Um, it seems that the uh, Fowler Theater Guild is doing the music man again. I have a funny feeling you guys are up for it again, right? You yeah. know, part, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, Christina and other younger people, I'd like you to sort of close your ears now because I, I think the lyrics to this first song is a bit naughty. It's called uh, Put on a 90. Put a 90 on Aphrodite. So, gentlemen, please. Husbands are flying tea, they're flying around and leaving their wives at home. Since Africa came into the town, they're going to that show wall show. There's only one thing. Yeah. 
there is some amazing talent in this room, as I can see, but throughout. And every once in a while, we're like, oh, it's just, just. But um, Dennis is going to be joined by a colleague, a friend of mine, who is a really fun person to have coffee with, but a spectacular pianist. Her name is Anne Parole. We'd like to introduce her. Oh, 
Coney, 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 goodbye, my Coney Allen baby. Farewell, my own true love, true love, Johnny. I'm gonna go and leave you. Never see you, Randy. Never gonna see you, Randy. I'm gonna sail up on that ferry boat. Never to return again, return again. So goodbye, farewell, so long forever. Bum, bum, goodbye, my Coney Island. The hour. Goodbye, my Coney Island. The hour. Goodbye, my Coney Island. And we all fall for some girl. Some girl likes to see me. Some girl. Some girl likes to be me. We meet her on the street and we'll join. I'll be a merry boobs to the altar, just like leading lambs to slaughter when it's over. Oh boy, we get it good. As your days we then recall, we then recall. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, actor, lawyer, merchant, sheep. We all.
we moved to town, but I don't like to think of the house we lived in. Right near the railroad tracks. So I guess we were lucky to have a roof over our heads because it was the first days of the Depression. A lot of people didn't even have a roof, even one that leaked. Mama was the sick one, but it was Papa who died first. By then, my brothers had married, and Mama and I moved into two back rooms that looked onto an alley and everybody's garbage cans. My brothers gave me enough every month for Mama's and my embarrassed expenses, even though their wives grumbled and complained. I tried to make Mama comfortable. I came to her every whim. I loved her. All the same, I had another reason to keep her alive as long as possible while she breathed and knew I had a place to stay. I was terrified of what would happen to me. My mom had died. I had no high school diploma and no experience in outside work, and I knew my sisters would not take me in or let my brother support me once mom was gone. And then mom had drew her last breath with a smile of thanks on her face for everything I had done. Sure enough, I was on my own. I had some respite when Mr. Williams, a widower, 24 years older than me, asked me to marry him. I took my house seriously. I meant to cherish him, and I did. But that house we lived in, the walls couldn't have been dirtier if they'd been smeared with soot, the plumbing was stubborn as a mule, and then Mr. Williams got sick and had to get up the shoe repair shop. He had a small savings account and a few government bonds and some disability insurance and and keep him cheerful. And I think it was by my willpower that I made a begonia bloom in the dark back room of Mr. Williams State. I even pestered his two daughters to send their father get well cards, and they did once. Of course, when Mr. Williams died, his daughters were jumping on the spot to see that they got their share of a little bit that tumble down has brought. I didn't begrudge them. Thanks. <laughs> 
20s all the way back to the 90s, and I sold them out to a place called Way Out, Hippie Clothiers. I tried to work out the exact amount I got for selling something, and then I'd do some work at a job at the cleaning room and kept putting off like wax in the hall upstairs or polishing the antennas or getting the linen closet in the water, all the same, I was stealing. Not everywhere I stayed, but when I had to, I stole, I admit it. But I didn't steal that silver box. I was innocent where that box was concerned. So when that policeman came toward me, grabbing at the box, I stepped aside, maybe I even gave him the push that sent him to his death. He had no business <laughs> acting like that. When the box was mine, whatever Mrs. Crow's niece said, anyway, the policeman was, was dead, and though I hadn't wanted him dead, I so said, well, and then I got to thinking, well, I didn't steal Mrs. Gross' box, but I had stolen other things, and it was the mills of God grinding exceedingly fine, as I had heard a preacher say, and I was being made to pay for transgressions that had caught up to me. I was never exactly clear in my own mind about everything that happened. Mrs. Crow was the most appreciative person I ever worked for. She was bad and could barely move. I, I used to massage her at night, and that pleased and soothed her. She thanked me for every small thing I did. I would fluff her pillow. I'd straighten the bed cover. She didn't sleep well. It seemed to give her pleasure to talk to me most of the night about her childhood or her dead husband. And two nights before she died, she said she wished she could do something for me. But that when she became an invalid, she had signed everything over to her niece. <laughs> anyway, Mrs. Crow said she hoped I would take her silver box. It pleased me that she liked me well enough to give me the box. I didn't have any use for it. In fact, it seemed to be her fondest possession. She kept it on the table beside her. Her eyes lit up every time she saw it. So, when she died and the niece dismissed me, I gathered up whatever I had and took the box and left. I didn't go to the funeral. The paper said it was private. I was invited. I still had a few dollars left over from the things I had sold, so I paid the week's rent for a room that was the worst I had ever stayed in. It was freezing cold. No heat came up from the third floor. And I was on the fourth. In that room with falling plaster and buckling floorboards and darting roaches, I sat wearing every stitch I owned with a quilt draped around me, waiting for the heat to rise, when in swept Mrs. Crow's niece in a fur coat and a fur hat. <laughs> and shiny leather boots up to her knees, her face was beat red from anger. She started telling me she traced me through a private detective, and I was like, give her back the ear of the I couldn't say anything. She kept on screaming. If I returned the box immediately, no criminal charges would be made. Then I got back my voice and I said, that box was mine and Mrs. Crow had wanted me to have it. She asked if I had any proof. And I said, no, when I'm given a present, I say, thank you. I didn't ask for proof or witnesses. And nothing can make me part with Mrs. Crow's box. You'll see. She yelled. And then she left. Not long afterward, I heard heavy steps clumping up the stairway. I realized the niece had carried out her threat. The police were after me. I was panic stricken. And then I thought that if they searched the room and couldn't find the box, it might give me time to decide what to do. So I grabbed the box out of the top drawer and started down the back hall. I snatched the back door open. I think what I intended to do was run down the back steps and hide the box somewhere underneath a bush or, or a garbage can. Those back steps were steep. <laughs> They rose almost straight up for four stories, and they were flimsy and covered with ice. I started down, my right foot slipped, the handrail saved me, I had clung to it with one hand and to the silver box with the other hand, and I picked my way across patches of ice, and then suddenly I heard my name shrieked. I looked around to see a big man leaping down the steps after me. I never saw such anger on a person's face. Then he was directly behind me, and he reached out to snatch the box. I swerved to escape his grasp, and he cursed me. I pushed him. I'm not sure. I'm not. Really. <laughs> anyway, he slipped, and he fell down, and, and down, and down. <laughs> and then he was absolutely 
still by the stairs beneath his cloak, like a pillow. And the rest of his body was spread on the brick walk. Then, almost like a pet that wants to follow its master, the silver box jumped from my hand and bounced down the steps to land beside his left ear. Breathing was numb, I felt paralyzed, and then I, I screamed, tenants from the house and the houses next door, pushed the windows open, flung the doors open, and then more police came, and they took the dead man's body and they drove me to the station. I was locked up. From the very beginning, I didn't take to that young lawyer that had signed to me. There wasn't anything I could put my finger on. I just felt uneasy with him. He was always smiling and reassuring me when there wasn't anything to be smiled or reassured about. All I could think was I was thankful Mama and Papa and Mr. Williams were dead and that my shame would bring shame on them. It's going to be all right, the lawyer kept saying to me. Right up until the end, and then he claimed to be indignant when I was found guilty of resisting arrest and of manslaughter and of theft or robbery. He would have thought it was the lawyer being sentenced instead of me and I carrying on. I've been a terrible listener to justice. So we might as well be back in the 18th century where they hang children. Well, that was an exaggeration if there ever was one. Anyway, that policeman had died, and I had a part in it, maybe I had pushed him. Stealing one. I hadn't stolen the box. I had stolen other things, though. More than once. And then... <laughs> it happened. There was a miracle. All my life, I dreamed of a room of my own. I'm not <laughs> Or a modern dignity armchair. I didn't get to decide what color bed spread I wanted. The window looked out on a beautiful lawn edged with shrubbery, and the matron said I'd be allowed to go to the greenhouse and select some plants to keep in my room. I didn't like the bars on the windows at all. <laughs> this day and age, some of the finest mansions have barred windows <laughs> to keep burglars out. <laughs> Thank you. 
his speech saying that a terrible miscarriage of justice had been rectified and he had located people who had testified. Mrs. Crow had given me the box and that he hadn't wanted to come forth and make statements. He also looked into the personnel record of the dead policemen and learned that he had been judged emotionally on all the time from lawyers talking into the microphones. He latched onto me like I was a three-year-old that might run away. When he had finished his speech, he gave a big grin in front of the camera. He waited goodbye, pushed me into the car. I was terrified. And that's it. I found this day. It wasn't lying anymore. My old nightmare was back. Wondering how I could manage to eat. And how much skin they might have to do to live from one day to the next. Then he drove off. I didn't dare look behind me because I was so heartbroken with what I was eating. The lawyer took me to his office. He said he had mapped out some public appearances for me. And the next morning, I was to be on an early morning television show. There was nothing to be worried about. He would be right beside me just as he had helped me throughout my trouble. All I had to say on the TV program was that I owed my freedom to him. Well, I guess I looked startled. I'm bewildered. Because he hurried on to say that I haven't been able to pay him. But now that I've paid him, paying back, not in money, but in letting the public know about how he was the champion of the underdog, that would be his fee. I said, I've been told that the court furnished lawyers free of charge to people who couldn't pay. And he said, oh, that was right. But his point was that I could pay him now by telling people all he had done for me. And then he said, the main thing was to talk over our appearance on TV. But first, he would go into his partner's office and tell him to take all the incoming calls and handle the rest of his appointments. So the door closed after him. And I thought, he was right. I did owe my freedom to him. He was to blame for it, the smart aleck. <laughs> Who asked him to bug him? Snatched me out of my pretty room and the work I loved and all that delicious food. I hated him. <laughs> <laughs> and before, when I was convicted of manslaughter, there was a lot of talk about malice and forethought, premeditated crime. There wouldn't be any argument this time. <laughs> Thank you. 
or no like of somebody else. Anybody other than Dean Martin? Who? Really? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you. 